Hey folks, Darren with Fervent Astronomy. We're finally doing it. We're doing the ISO invariance video. This is going to save me so much time in the future, but not in the present, because I have a bunch of videos pre-recorded that uh, I still explain ISO invariance halfway in each of them, but that's okay. From now on, there will come a point where I'll be able to just say, watch the video I made, and that will be great. There's a lot to cover here. I've got a sticky note that's just crammed with notes. First off, I want to say I am not the smartest cookie. I am not an expert in this. I am not the authoritative source. I'm just someone who's interested in some nerdy stuff and likes to do research and learn about it and finds it useful. And I'm disseminating that knowledge to you. I'm fallible. I'm a human. Some of this might not be 100% accurate, but the broad strokes should be. So keep that in mind. Another thing to keep in mind, this is not all cameras. Not every camera is an ISO invariant camera. Many, if not most, modern newish cameras are because technology has come to the point where this is the best way to do things to get the best balance for image quality, but not all of them are, especially not older cameras. So we'll show you how to find out if your camera is ISO invariant. I need to mention this right at the jump. Changing your ISO does not change the sensitivity of your sensor. That feels like it's true in practice that it changes the sensitivity, but that's not how it works at all. Without trying to get too much into it, we're going to show you some real world examples here, maybe talk a little bit about how the camera actually does accomplish a change in image brightness when you change your ISO. But I need you to know that it's not actually changing the sensitivity of your sensor. In any case, you got a certain number of photons that come in and hit the sensor, and they are the only signal that you have to work with. There's no way to magically make more of that by having a higher sensitivity sensor, okay? Now we'll see we have four images here, these two images, are taken with the A7R Mark IV, same day, quite a while ago, actually, <laughs> looking at it. Same lens, same focal length, same aperture, and they would have been the same exposure time, except that this one ran one second longer than this one. But I assure you that extra second isn't gonna contribute much difference to what I'm trying to show you. You will notice that the brighter image is taken at ISO 2000, the darker image at 320, this other set of images, it's very similar, and you will notice it's a different optic, focal length, aperture, but those are all standardized. The exposure time is the same between the two of them. And again, the darker image is at a base ISO of 320, and the brighter image here is much brighter, actually. It's ISO 8000. So, first of all, ISO invariance. Why should you care? Well, because there is a chance that you might be able to capture more data in your photos without leaving anything on the table. No downside all upside. These are both 60 second exposures nominally. This one, as you can imagine, probably looks better on the back of the camera than this one. But this dark image has all the information that the brighter image has. It has the same noise profile. It has the same ability to boost the shadows. There's no difference between these two. This brighter image taken at ISO 2000 doesn't give you anything except a nicer preview on the back of the camera. However, the darker image actually has more information in the highlights and that can be really useful. It actually has more information than the brighter one, and it could be a better choice. Let's come in here. We'll notice the satellite trail here. This will help us distinguish. This is going to be the ISO 2000 image, and this is the ISO 320 image. ISO 320 is two and two thirds stops darker than ISO 2000. So if we come through here and we boost it by two and two thirds stops, we get an image of nominally the same brightness. Satellite trail is actually coming in handy. 320, 2000. 320, 2000, 320, 2000. Do you notice a difference? No, of course you don't, because they're basically the same image. Now, some of you might be saying, oh, well, that's zoomed all the way out. What if you zoom all the way in? Well, let's zoom all the way in. This is the corner of the ISO 320 image, same corner of the ISO 2000 image. 320, 2000, 320, 2000, 320, 2000, 320, 2000. Now, there is a tiny bit of variation between the two images, as you would expect between even two images taken at the same ISO back to back with all the same settings. But in a blind test, I really doubt anyone could tell me which one of these images was taken at 320 and which one was taken at ISO 2000. And this is at the darkest portion of the frame. This is where it was vignetting in the corner away from the Milky Way. And there's a little bit of noise in each photo and the exact grain structure changes from photo to photo. In the two photos, there's slightly different white balance and that's something that could easily be rectified. To say that one of these is significantly cleaner than the other is, I feel, a difficult proposition. Okay, so why is that? Well, for this camera, ISO 320 is one of the camera's two base ISOs. And every ISO above ISO 320 is an image derived 
from ISO 320. What does that mean? Well, it means that the camera takes this image at ISO 320, and if you have ISO 2000 selected, it just boosts the exposure digitally and locks it into the RAW file. And there you go, you've got your ISO 2000 shot. What that does, however, is it locks in the highlights at this higher value. And for something like the Milky Way, that's not a huge deal, right? But if you were taking photo of a galaxy, the galaxy core is pretty bright relative to the rest of the galaxy, or maybe a bright nebula, say like the Orion Nebula, where you have the trapezium, like really bright in there, star forming region, and it gets really dim towards the outside, you're probably going to have to do exposure bracketing. But when you try and capture the fainter detail, you will blow out the center. And when you try and capture the center detail, you will underexpose all the rest of it. And you could take a bunch more photos, or you could optimize the photos you're already taking and maybe have to take less. And this is where the benefit of using one of the base ISOs in an ISO invariant camera comes into play. So let's take a look at this star here, for instance. Let's really get in there. All right, we're at 1600. Bright, bright star. And let's see what happens if we crank the highlights down. Well, we recover a little bit. The bright patch shrinks a little bit, but not very much. Let's bring the exposure down. Oh, well, the star didn't shrink anymore, but the center went gray. And why is that? Well, it's because the center was pure white. So when you drop the exposure on pure white, you start to go through the grays. So there's no actual information there. If we come here to our ISO 320 shot, we crank those highlights down, right away we get a little bit more color. We also get some chromatic aberration. And if we drop the exposure, things don't shrink all the way down to like a very nice tight pinpoint, of course, but they did get smaller and there is gray in the middle, but it's not as uniform and it's much smaller patch. So let's flip back and forth. So this is ISO 320. This is ISO 2000. In the ISO 320 shot, we can rein this bright star in and have it appear smaller and less bright and more colorful. And then the ISO 2000 shot, it's just kind of big and bloated and bright, and there's nothing we can do. And then you're going to have to go through different algorithms or Starnet++ or something like that if you want to tame these stars down and start going down that road. You can't actually do any of that working with the RAW file, and it might be a benefit too. Often when working with Milky Way photos, it's a positive thing to have the stars dimmed down a little bit, diminished a little bit, so they provide less of a noisy, grainy image, and maybe we can see more of the nebulosity and the dust lanes and that sort of thing. So that's one example. Here we have another example and sort of a, a couple of really bad offenders as far as those bright stars go. Now I do have to say right away, this is the same camera that we were just looking at, but since my A7R Mark IV is modified, I have the option of swapping in different filters. So I can put in a certain filter and maintain out of the box color reproduction, or I can swap in another filter and get a modified camera reproduction. I get more of those reds. This is what the out of camera frame actually looks like. I just did a little lazy color balance on it to rectify things a little bit. Unfortunately, those clip in filters with certain optics cause some extra vignetting. That's what the dark bar and corners are. The Red Cat 71 here is a fairly long distance between the back of the lens element and the sensor. Because of that, some of the light cone ends up clipping on the filter. That's what's going on there. Here, ISO 8000, and we can see that these foreground stars are very bright, very bloated. You've got a lot of contrast around them. And then if we come here to the ISO 320 shot, now keep in mind, this is a three minute exposure, but if we come in here and look at these stars, we can see that they're much, much smaller, much tighter. So ISO 320 is four and two thirds stops below ISO 8000. So if we do a little bit of an adjustment there, all of a sudden we have a very, very similar photo. However, notice each of these big stars and even each of the smaller stars are given that bloat, there's a loss of contrast that you don't see in the ISO 320 photo. So if we come in here, and this is our ISO 8000 shot, and we try and bring these highlights down, we can see we've got a big halo around the star, and look, there's even other stars being obscured by that. And if we bring the exposure down, well, this is pretty clearly completely blown out, just solid gray, and it's impinging on these background stars. Not great. In the ISO 320 shot, if we bring the highlights down, got a little bit of a similar situation, we can start to reveal these stars. And if we bring down that exposure, well, I think you can clearly see that there is a difference here. Here we can recover these stars. The blown out star is a lot tighter. It is still blown out in the middle, but it's a lot tighter. And in the ISO 8000 shot, it's just really, really obnoxious. So this is going to be better and easier to deal with. And this is going to give you just a, a worse image overall, in my opinion. So that is a real world benefit of having an ISO invariant camera. You can preserve highlights. So how do you find out if you have an ISO invariant camera? Well, luckily there's a resource out there. There's a website called photons2photos.net. 
And this is put together by a dude named Bill Claff. And I gotta give props to the guy. He has put together an enormous amount of high quality information and he's doing it on his own time. He's not charging for it. So this is a really cool resource. We're gonna come over to the left here. And the third option currently says read noise in DN's chart. We're gonna click on that. We get a blank graph and a huge list of cameras. And this says read noise in DN's versus ISO setting. Okay. So ISO setting, we should all understand that. Read noise. What's read noise? Well, there are certain types of noise that can make it into the system. And noise is something you could think of it as fake signal. In an ideal world, all the photons that came into your camera got read by the sensor and all of that information got perfectly transported and turned into a photo. But real life is a lot messier than that. And there's certain types of noise that can get into the system. And one of those types is read noise. That's noise that sneaks in through the circuitry, all of the processing that happens, all the reading out of the signal before you actually get your final image. These days, read noise is fairly low, which is what actually allows ISO invariant cameras to be a popular choice. However, it is distorting the signal a little bit. And that's one of the reasons we get noise. And what this chart can tell us is how our particular camera is operating. So we're not so much concerned with how much noise or anything like that. There's actually, you, if you see down here, you can't use these graphs to compare camera to camera. It's just not what they're meant for, but you can use the graph to see what your camera is doing when it comes to ISO. So we were just looking at photos from an A7R Mark IV, and here is the graph for the A7R Mark IV. Right away, you'll notice that it's got sort of a zigzaggy appearance, and that can tip you off that you're dealing with ISO invariants. At the top here, it indicates that an open symbol, so that'd be these ones where they're white in the middle at the ends, indicates values outside the normal analog range. So what these are, are typically the extended ISOs. And these are not ISOs that I would very much recommend using. They don't actually give you any benefits. A triangle up indicates scaling. So that would be if the camera is boosting the brightness, for instance, in one or more color channels. A triangle down indicates noise reduction. Here we see triangles down and a diamond indicates both. We don't have any diamonds here. So I want you to ignore the little ends where they're open and just pay attention to this series of dots here. And you'll see it starts at 100, goes up to 250. And I do want to address, I know it says 251. These are the actual ISO values. You might not be aware, but what is mathematically ISO 251 is rounded down in your camera to read as ISO 250. Same with 318, which is 320, 503, which is 500. You get the idea, round to the nearest ISO. It goes up and it has a very straight linear curve here. And it drops and then it goes up again and it is again a linear curve. So this is telling us two things about this camera. The first thing it's telling us is this is a dual conversion gain sensor. What the heck does that mean? Well, there's two conversion gain steps. One at 100 and then one at 320. And this is very common with modern sensors. You'll see they'll have a base ISO, usually 100. It'll go up and then it will drop some amount at some point. And that's the second stage. And then it keeps going. And the reason they do this is so that if you have a lot of light, you have, let's say you're shooting in the bright daylight, you can use lower ISO values and get lower noise. If we were to only have one stage here and it just kept going, you would notice that this line would have proportionally higher noise for each ISO as compared to this one. Now this second stage here, because it resets down lower again and goes up into the mid and high ISOs, this gives us better noise performance at these high ISOs. But again, if you came down here and extrapolated down, well, we would get a base ISO of 160 and we wouldn't be able to go any lower than that. And if we had a really bright scene, we might not be able to expose properly. So this having these two stages gives the best of both worlds. So you can think of these two bottom dots, in this case, 100, and 320. These are the analog stages. Everything past those are digital. If you're using any of these ISOs, the camera is capturing this image at ISO 320 because it only has two conversion gain steps. And then it's in software digitally just boosting the brightness. And depending on the ISO you chose in the camera, it just locks that particular brightness in. And the reason this is a good choice for modern sensors is because they've advanced so much that they have very low read noise. When you do this digitally and you just take this image at ISO 320 and add a couple stops of brightness to it, not only are you boosting the signal, but you're boosting any noise that was in there by the same amount. And traditionally, that wasn't a great thing to do because read noise was fairly high in older sensors. But now that it's fairly low, waiting till after you've got your essentially finished digital image and just boosting the exposure value of it is actually the optimal thing to do versus using analog amplification further upstream. However, in the case here, you do have two different analog stages, but only two, not one for every single ISO. 
So this is ISO invariance. And if we come through here, let's look at some modern cameras like the Nikon Z8, or let's see, maybe the Canon R5 Mark II. Now you can't compare these using this graph for noise. So please fanboys don't be like, ah, oh, this one's better than that. No. That's not what this graph is showing you, but it does show you that these are all invariant cameras and that they have dual conversion gain. So with a Nikon, your base ISO is 63, and then your second base ISO is at 500, the Z8 and Z9. R5 Mark II, it's going to be the same as the Sony here. The first analog stage is at 100. Unlike the Sony, the second is at 500. And everything in between here, all digital. You will notice as we get up here that the Sony is applying noise reduction after ISO 12,800. You notice that the Nikon camera is doing some scaling once you get past ISO 3200. So it's artificially brightening one or more channels as well. But there's something that's obfuscated here that's very interesting. So we're going to take a look at that. Doesn't really have anything to do with ISO invariance, but it's something that you might want to know. See all the down triangles? Well, in the Canon R5 Mark II, it's baking noise reduction into every single ISO stage. So what this means is it's essentially cooking its RAWs a little bit. You are not getting full RAW. Even if you shoot in RAW, what's happening is the noise profile will look a little bit better, but that's because noise reduction is being done in camera before the image is in your hands. And I don't generally like that very much. Some other manufacturers do that as well. Pentax is pretty notorious for it. This is the curve for the Pentax K3 Mark III. You can see all the way through noise reduction. This isn't the best for astrophotography because it's taking some of the data away from you. Let's add the original R5 in here as well. We'll just turn off the R5 Mark II. We can see that at lower ISOs, there was noise reduction. But in the original R5, after about ISO 800, you're not getting noise reduction through the main ISO range. And why is this worth mentioning? Well, when you're doing astrophotography, you have a very powerful means of dealing with noise. Stacking, taking multiple frames and combining them after, boosts the signal and it helps cancel out the noise. So when there's noise reduction happening in the raw file before you ever get it into your hands, it's robbing you of some information that you could have made use of and it's not giving you anything that you couldn't get better yourself through another means. So something to keep in mind there. Let's really quickly look at some other graphs. This is a Canon 5D Mark III. Here you see it kind of is a bit up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down, and then it has a straight-ish portion. This isn't what you would call an invariant sensor but it is making use of some of these same concepts. Here, analog stage at ISO 100, then it's digitally amplifying to get ISO 125. Then you have another analog stage here at 160, and for the next two ISOs, digital amplification. ISO 320, analog amplification stage, next to digital, analog, digital, analog, digital. You get the, you get the drift. So there's a mix here, and that functions to maintain a pretty low noise floor as far as read noise is concerned, because that was probably concerned with this sensor when it was built. They would rather employ some analog amplification every couple of stages, which will, by its own nature, amplify some noise, but it won't amplify all the noise that gets into the file if you do digital amplification after the camera's wrapped everything up into a digital package. That's how that was handled. This is another type of graph you might run into. This is the 5DSR. This is a parabolic curve, very smooth. This is indicating that each of these steps are analog. Each of these steps is analog amplification all the way up to the top ISO of 6400. And then the stretch ISO here of 12,800. This is one of those extended ISOs that I wouldn't recommend. And in this sensor, you know, this was, I think, the first 50 megapixel full frame sensor on the market. This is probably the best route to keep read noise at a minimum because each time they use one of these analog amplification stages, they are boosting noise in the system upstream of the amplifier. However, they're not boosting all the read noise downstream of that amplifier. And that was probably a better choice. This is not an invariant sensor. Here you have to make a trade-off and decide on what amount of exposure and what amount of noise in the final results is the best balance for you. In this case, lower is always going to be better from a noise perspective, but that might necessitate some really long exposure times. Okay, I think we did it. I think this is less than an hour. I really hope so. <laughs> Uh, if you're at the end here, I hope you found this informative. Thanks for sticking with it. I'm Darren from Fervent Astronomy. Thanks so much. Hopefully we'll, we'll see you in the next one.